Welcome to a look ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. You recognize probably that we, we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is entitled Oneness in Christ. And this lesson is entitled Church Organization and Unity. It's lesson number 12 in our series for December 22 of 2018. What does church organization have to do with unity? Should that be an important contributor or a de defector from room unity? Well, we'll have to figure that out. As usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Father, we have gathered here this day to talk about you and to, to try to understand more clearly what you have in store for us in terms of unity, in terms of oneness in Christ, and what factors might be adding to that and what factor, factors might be detracting from it. We belong to a church organization that is worldwide. In almost every country of the world a recognized presence. And yet there are so many different ideas um, that people have about how things should go and what should happen, what shouldn't happen. Can a church organization like this really be unified? Guide us and direct us as we discuss this important topic is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, according to our Bible study guide, as Seventh-day Adventists, we are Protestant Christians who believe that salvation is through faith alone in what Jesus Christ has accomplished for humanity. That's in the lesson for December 15, Sabbath afternoon. What do we mean when we say faith alone in what Jesus Christ has accomplished for humanity? Does that leave out the rest of the universe? How does that fit with our understanding of the great controversy? To answer your question, the first one, yes, it does leave out the rest of the universe. I thought you were going to answer the second one, too. I was, <laughs> I was fixated on the first. <laughs> Okay, so we believe if we have a full understanding of the great controversy as understood by people in scripture, and I think especially Ellen White, that the entire universe is involved in the great controversy. Remember that great controversy not, did not begin here with Adam and Eve's falling away. It began in heaven, and a third of the beings from heaven were led astray. So they, we cannot leave them out. Everything we say about the plan of salvation needs to include them. So your opening line should, it should read, as Seventh-day Adventists, we are Protestant Christians who believe that salvation is through faith alone in what Jesus Christ has accomplished for the entire universe. Yes. For all beings in the entire universe. Yes. Well, Jesus tried to prepare his disciples for a lifetime of service before he left them a few days before Pentecost. He recognized that they would need to work together as far as possible to spread the gospel. He also recognized that church organization would be necessary for the efficient spread of the gospel. That is what churches are for. Church leaders are supposed to follow the example of Jesus. And of course they always do, right? <laughs> Don't everyone talk at the same time? <laughs> well... <laughs> well. Well, our Bible study guide suggests that church leaders are chosen because they illustrate the example of Jesus. Is that always true? In a two-letter word, no. Okay. Is there any politicking going on as we choose church leaders? Yes. This lesson will focus on why we need church organization and what difference that makes. Well, I'd like to pull the great controversy into this, so Let's start off with Colossians 1, 18 to 20. Kerry? Yes. He is the head of and his he body. he is talking about who? Jesus. Jesus. Yeah. yeah. Okay. He is the head of his body, the church. He is the source of the body's life. He is the firstborn son who was raised from death in order that he alone might have the first place in all things. For it was by God's own decision that the Son has in himself the full nature of God. Through the Son, then, God decided to bring the whole universe back to himself. God made peace through his Son's blood on the cross and so brought back to himself all things, 
both on earth and in heaven. That's from the Good News Translation. In the ancient languages, especially Hebrew, uh, since there was no comparative or superlative forms, you emphasize the point by repeating it. So what he was here, it says he brings the whole universe back to himself, then he brings all things, both in earth and in heaven. Is he trying to emphasize that point? Mm. Sounds like it, doesn't mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. With Christ as the head of the church, God plans to bring the entire universe together again. So what are they supposed to learn from us here on planet Earth? What do you think they are learning? The result of rebellion. Is the result of sin. rebellion, sure enough. It's misery. Yep. Wow. Well, no serious Bible student would question the idea that Christ is the head of the church, or at least he's supposed to be. But how does that work out in practical reality? If you were watching things in the middle of the Dark Ages, would you think Christ was the head of the church? Well, look at Ephesians 5, 21 to 27. Submit yourselves to one another because, your reverent, because of your reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for a husband has authority over his wife, just as Christ has authority over the church. And Christ is himself the savior of the church's body. And so wives must submit completely to their husbands, just as the church submits itself to Christ. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave his life for it. He did this to dedicate the church to God by his word after making it clean by washing it in water in order to present the church to himself in all its beauty, pure and faultless, without spot or wrinkle or any, such or any other imperfection. Men ought to love their wives just as they love their own bodies. A man who loves his wife loves himself. People never hate their own bodies. Instead, they feed them and take care of them just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. And the story goes on, but we'll conclude there. In these verses, the ideal relationship between a husband and a wife is used as a symbol of how Christ is, is related to the church and vice versa. So Christ has authority over the church. He is the savior of the church, which is his body. The church must submit itself completely to Christ. Christ loves the church so much that he gave his life for the church. He did that to purify the church, dedicating it to himself pure and faultless. Well, that's a pretty awesome relationship, isn't it? Are you comfortable with those ideas? Human leaders have abused the idea of authority while forcing submission on those who are below them so frequently that we instinctively rebel against the idea of submission. But if we recognize that the one to whom we are to submit is Jesus Christ, all problems should go away. Margaret? The church is built upon Christ as its foundation. It is to obey Christ as its head. It is not to depend upon man or to be controlled by man. Many claim that the position of trust in the church gives them authority to dictate what other men shall believe and what they shall do. This claim God does not sanction. The Savior declares, All ye are brethren. All are exposed to temptation and are liable to error. Upon no finite being can we depend on for guidance. The rock of faith is the living presence of Christ in the church. Upon this the weakest may depend, and those who think themselves the strongest will prove to be the weakest, unless they make Christ their efficiency. Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm. The Lord is the rock. His work is perfect. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. It's from Jeremiah 17, 5, Deuteronomy 32, 4, Psalms 12, 2, 12, and it's uh, from Ellen White, The Desire of Ages, page uh, 4, 14, 3. Very good. So how can we develop a relationship of dependence upon Christ instead of depending upon our fellow human beings? It, it's easier to go to a human being that you think you can sort of corral and force them to do, to give you the information you need or help you in some way. How do you do that with God? You can't manipulate God. Yeah, you notice that too? Hmm. 
think about the story of <laughs> politics in our church organization often is a lot of manipulation and that's what you see on a lot of a lot of religious broadcasting yeah yeah. Remember the story of Hophni and Phinehas, the sons of Eli? They thought they could manipulate God by taking the Ark of the Covenant down into battle. God would have to help them win. Mm -hmm. What happened? The Philistine got the Ark. The Philistines carried off the Ark. And Hophni and Phinehas died. Well, it's quite clear from reading the Gospels that the disciples of Christ believed that he would one day be ruler of the nation of Israel and that they would hold high positions in his government. This led to their having repeated arguments about which of them was the greatest. And you all know about this, but look especially at Luke 22, 24. <coughs> and we're, here we are they, are, they are entering the, the upper room in preparation for that last night with Jesus. They don't know that, but that's what was happening. And then it says, an argument broke out among the disciples as to which one of them should be thought of as the greatest. Were they arguing about which one would, get set, would, be, would be given permission to sit next to Christ? Were they arguing about the fact that he had just made a triumphal entry into Jerusalem? And they thought, okay, tonight's going to be the time when he's going to announce his kingdom. I get Secretary of State. Okay. <laughs> you get Vice President. Okay. Wow. And of course, he ended up, Jesus ended up doing what? In fact, they were arguing about who was the greatest as they were entering the upper room for the Last Supper. Jesus set forth a very clear principle for Christian leaders. Look at Matthew 20, verses 25 to 28. So Jesus called them all together and said, You know that the rulers of the heathen have power over them, and the leaders have complete authority. This, however, is not the way it shall be among you. If one of you wants to be great, he must be the servant of the rest. And if one of you wants to be first, he must be your slave, mm. like the Son of Man, who did not come to be served, but to serve, to give his life, to redeem many people. You suppose that was right before he went to wash their feet? It would have fit pretty good. Yeah. If one of you wants to be first, he must be your slave. And they would have been speechless if they listened to him say that, and then he reached over and got this basin and started washing their feet. Gordon? Amazing. From the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, a quote. In this concise passage, Jesus presents us with two models of authority. The first is the Roman idea of authority. In this model, the elite stand hierarchically over others. They have the power to make decisions and expect submission from those below them. Jesus clearly rejected this model of authority when he stated, not so with you. Instead, he presented the disciples with a breathtakingly new model of authority, a thorough rejection or reversal of the hierarchical model which with which they were familiar. And that's taken from Darius or Darius Jankwick, Serving Like Jesus, Authority in God's Church, from Adventist Review, 2014, and quoted in the Bible Study Guide for Monday. Will God continue to serve us when we get to heaven? Jesus knelt down and washed 12 pairs of dirty feet, including the feet of Judas. Do you think the Father would do that? Ellen White says, if the Father had come, not one thing would be different. The Father had come instead of Jesus. Wow. How do you think God will, I mean, what kind of relation, I, and I ask myself this question fairly often, what kind of a relationship will we have to God when we get to heaven? We will still be dependent upon him for every metabolic process, every pulse of the heart, every breath that we take. Yeah. For the perfection of heaven itself. So we can't. Restoration. And yet he says we're supposed to call him daddy. 
What does that imply? Very loving relationship. Mm -hmm. Appreciation. Respect. We, uh, we all know that uh, there's a church group, a Christian church group, w which holds Mary into very high reverence, almost in God's place. I don't personally subscribe to that idea, but I, I, I'm trying to imagine myself what it'll be when we arrive in heaven and Jesus, as God, says, Hi, Mom, to Mary. Mm. How would that impact us? Well, clearly Christ was emphasizing and demonstrating a completely new kind of leadership. We call it servant leadership. He recognized that authoritative structures must exist, but he also emphasized that those who want to be leaders of those structures must be servants to all. Christ was establishing a kingdom on different principles. <coughs> he called men not to authority, but to service. The strong to bear the infirmities of the weak. Power, position, talent, education, and place their possessor under the greater obligation to serve their fellows. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 550. Okay, so all of you who have a lot of education, do you people who have uh, positions of authority, do you think, yourself, think of yourself as being under greater obligation to serve others? I asked you out there, is that the way we usually think of it? If you look at it as obligation, do you look at it as a privilege, as, as a joy? I think it's uh, something you're, you're submitting to uh, as an obligation. I don't think you've arrived yet. Maybe we have more responsibility to share what we have learned and what we know that can help people. Okay, returning to the story of Jesus and his disciples, we look at John 13, first 20 verses or so. It was now the day before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Jesus knew that, but nobody else knew that. He had always loved those in the world who were his own, and he loved them to the very end. Jesus and his disciples were at supper. The devil had already put into the heart of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, the thought of betraying Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him completely, complete power. He knew that he had come from God and was going to God, so he rose from the table. So because of what he knew about his relationship to the Father, he rose from the table, took off his outer garment, and tied a towel around his waist. Then he poured some water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and dry them with the towel round his waist. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Are you going to wash my feet, Lord? Jesus answered him, You do not understand now what I'm doing, but you will understand later. Peter declared, Never at any time will you wash my feet. If I do not wash your feet, Jesus answered, You will no longer be my disciple. Simon Peter answered, Lord, do not wash only my feet, then wash my hands and my head too. Jesus said, those who have had a bath are completely clean and do not have to wash themselves except for their feet. All of you are clean, all except one. Jesus already knew who was going to betray him, and that is why he said, all of you except one are clean. After Jesus had washed their feet, he put, out his, put his outer garment back on, returned to his place at the table. Do you understand what I have just done to you, he asked. You call me teacher and Lord, and it is right that you do so, because that is what I am. I, your Lord and teacher, have, you, have just washed your feet. You then should wash one another's feet. I have set an example for you so that you will do just what I have done for you. I am telling you the truth. Slaves are never greater than their master. Messengers are never greater than the one who sent them. Now that you know this truth, how happy you will be if you put it into practice. Are you really happy when you get to wash somebody's feet? I'm not talking about all of you. I know those who I have chosen. But the scripture must come true that says, The man who shared my food turned against me. I tell you this now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am who I am. What is the meaning of I am who I am? Yahweh. Yahweh. That's the personal name of God. 
I am telling you the truth, whoever receives me, anyone I send receives me also, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. Wow. Well, apparently, the upper room had been prepared for them to come and enjoy the Passover supper together. We do not know exactly what happened, but apparently a servant had left the basin of water and the towel in the room, but was nowhere to be found when the group arrived. After having argued about who should be the greatest, none of the disciples was ready to wash the feet of his fellow disciples. And so, as we know, Jesus took off his outer garment, wrapped the towel around his waist, began washing the feet of each of the twelve disciples, including Judas. How would you feel if you knew that God was washing your dirty feet? Do you think the Father or the Holy Spirit would have done that? Is Jesus any less God than they are? Look at a couple of passages. 2 Timothy 2.15 Do your best to win full approval in God's sight as a worker who is not ashamed of his work, one who correctly teaches the message of God's truth. And Titus 1.9 he must hold firmly to the message which can be trusted and which agrees with the doctrine. In this way, he will be able to encourage others with the true teaching and also to show the error of those who are opposed to it. Well, based on these verses, a true Christian leader is to faithfully teach the truth about God and point out errors that people might otherwise believe. Keeping the doctrines and principles as pure as possible is essential. Our set of fundamental teachings and beliefs is one of the main unifying forces in our church. While they may be variously understood by groups in different continents and different cultures, nevertheless, they do provide a unifying basis for belief. Well, let's see what we can learn more about that. In his final letter that we have preserved for us, Paul reminds, and what's his final letter? Timothy. Second Timothy. Paul reminded Timothy of something he no doubt said to him many times earlier. 2 Timothy 4, 1 to 5. Kerry? In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and because he is coming to rule as king, I solemnly urge you to preach the message, to insist upon proclaiming it, whether the time is right or not, to convince, reproach, and encourage as you teach with all patience. The time will come when people will not listen to sound doctrine, but will follow their own desires and will collect for themselves more and more teachers who will tell them what they are itching to hear. They will turn away from listening to the truth and give their attention to legends. But you must keep control of yourself in all circumstances, endure suffering, do the work of a preacher of the good news, and perform your whole duty as a servant of God. Wow. I think of those words, um, you must control your, keep control of yourself in all circumstances, endure suffering. Do you remember what happened to Paul in Timothy's hometown? Isn't that where he was stoned? That's where he was stoned and yeah. dragged out of town and left for dead in Timothy's hometown. Sure, Timothy remembered that very well. Well, the future would not be easy for Christian leaders. We know that now at this end of history, don't we? He reminded Timothy that Jesus is coming back to rule as king, but before that time comes, people will try to choose leaders who will say what they want them to say, rather than rebuking their problems and guiding them into all truth. Why is it that church leaders don't like to rebuke error? One of the reasons might be because they might not be liked by the people, and mm. maybe the people won't give as much money. Wow. Did I say that? <laughs> I think you just did. <laughs> Timothy was challenged to endure suffering if need be and to be a preacher of the good news. A few sentences earlier, we have his words as recorded in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching the truth, rebuking, rebuking error, correcting faults, and giving instruction for right living, so that the person who serves God may be fully qualified and equipped to do every kind of good deed. From the Good okay. News Bible. Well, churches who have leaders who are following those guidelines are truly blessed. Are the leaders of your churches out there 
clearly working together to encourage unity and cooperation. Well, unity and cooperation in doing what? What is the main mission of the church? Spreading, Spreading the gospel. gospel. <clears throat> Have you ever been at a church where the pastor said, you, come with me and let's give a Bible study? Isn't I that actually was. How did that work out? Mm -hmm. It wasn't as good as you might think, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Really? Well, I mean, do we agree or don't we agree that the purpose of the church is to spread the gospel? That's the purpose of the organization. So, is there a way we can make that more interesting? You know, there's a, a plan that's being put into practice by some churches to, and even some conferences now here in the United States where there's some lessons on DVD. And you take it to, to, a, patient, to a person, say, listen to this and I'll come back and we can talk about it. And then you come back with some question and answer sheets that, that ask questions about what you saw. And they're, they're very attractive. I think that maybe that's something that almost anybody could do. <coughs> well, one of, the most, um, one of the most difficult things that church leaders have to deal with is discipline. Discipline is necessary for at least two reasons. To preserve the purity and example of the church. Does our church need to be preserved pure? And two, to promote purity among church members. When open sin occurs among church members, something must be done. Jesus himself set forth a principle for dealing with such sins in Matthew 18, 15 to 20. That says, if your brother sins against you, go to him and show him his fault. But do it privately, just between yourselves. If he listens to you, you have won your brother back. But if he will not listen to you, take one or two other persons with you so that every accusation may be upheld by the testimony of two or more witnesses. As the scripture says, and if he will not listen to them, tell the whole thing to the church. Finally, if he will not listen to the church, treat him as though he were a pagan or a tax collector. Wow. And how are pagans and tax collectors to be treated? With love. Yeah, yeah. They're supposed to be a encouraged to join the church, right? Yes. And so I tell all of you, what you prohibit on earth will be prohibited in heaven. What you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. That's a little bit of a troublesome yes. <coughs> bit of scripture because we have seen that being used again to manipulate. Yes. And I tell you more, whenever two of you on earth agree about anything you pray for, it will do be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three, pers three come together in my name, I am there with them, the good news. And you've heard people misuse that too. I remember a book that came out in a movement at one time in the Adventist church that certain gentleman was preaching that if a group of people get together and they pray hard enough for something, it will happen. We just got to pray harder. Um, it didn't always work out that way. It didn't work out that way for Jesus, did it? Mm -mm. Well, in order to be an effective witness to the world around it, the church must be pure and Christ-like. Do you think our church would attract more people if it was Christ-like? Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> well, discipline is sometimes necessary to maintain the ideal. We know that. When discipline becomes necessary, we should remember the advice of Jesus as recorded in Matthew 7, 1 through 5. Let's look at that. Do not judge others so that God will not judge you. For God will judge you in the same way as you judge others. And he will apply to you the same rules you apply to others. Why then do you look at the speck in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the log in your own eye? How dare you say to your brother, please let me take the speck out of your eye when you have a log in your own eye. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye and then you'll be able to see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Now is that 
is Jesus trying to say to us that uh, we need to get the specks out of our other uh, out of our? I mean, we need to get the logs out of our own eyes so we can go around picking specks out of other people's eyes. Is that his goal? I think so. <laughs> wow. But clearly, uh, w w what's he trying to really say there? Are you trying to say we need to get rid of the huge defects in yourself before you even think about criticizing someone else? Yeah. And don't even criticize someone else then. Yeah. <laughs> well, Paul wrote something about that as well. Galatians 6, verses 1 and 2. My brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in any kind of wrongdoing, those of you who are spiritual should set him, them right. But you must do it in a gentle way and keep an eye on yourselves so that you will not be tempted to help to carry one another's burdens. And in this way, you will obey the law of Christ. Help to carry one another's burdens. What do you suppose that means? Is that financial? Is that physical? I mean, you go over and help them cut their lawn and whatever. What does that involve? How, how does that happen in a church? Do we always behave in the kindest, gentlest way when trying to reprove evil? No. You know what I heard? So-and-so was da-da-da-da. Over the back pants, right? I once saw a cartoon of two ladies talking over the back fence. And one lady says to the other, says, the other lady is asking her about something if she's heard such and such thing. She says, yeah, I heard about that a long time, but I don't pass along things I hear. And the other lady gets a very sour look on her face. She says, so you're the bottleneck. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Oh. <laughs> well, but we need more people like that, right? Well. Are our actions, when we relate to others, even people outside of the church, are they redemptive and not punitive? I uh, don't like to tell stories about myself, but one of the last patients I saw, in fact, the last patient I saw today in the clinic was a young woman who was quite ill. She had type 1 diabetes, and her, her diabetes was not well controlled, and there were lots of problems, and we were trying to work that worked that all out and her boyfriend was there with her and he was in sh and he was the only one way she had of getting around he was taking her here and there and carrying her around and he took one look at me and he said you look like Abraham Lincoln <laughs> and I said okay thank you for that compliment I need a hat <laughs> I, you need, I need a, yeah I need a top hat don't I yeah and then a little bit later I said you know to the young lady I said to her you know you really we need to help you. We'll do everything we possibly can, but you need God's help as well. May I pray for you? So I took her hand, I took his hand, and I prayed for them. And the young man, who wasn't the patient, says, I like this doctor. He looks like Abraham Lincoln, and he prays for us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's but sweet. that's, I mean, that's the kind of thing that we need to do, I think. That's a great opportunity. Yeah. We also need to recognize that the church has one essential purpose and that it is to spread the gospel to those around us. Remember our, one of our key passages, which you must have memorized maybe multiple times if you went to an Adventist school. I get my, my, there I go. You remember these words? Jesus drew near and said to them, I have been given all authority upon in heaven and on earth, go then to all peoples everywhere make them my disciples baptize them in the name of the father the son and the holy ghost and teach them to obey everything i have commanded you and i will be with you always to the end of the age that's pretty pretty interesting command notice that in his words to his disciples jesus gave them four commands what were the four commandments what are the four commands i'm sorry go go make disciples, make disciples baptize and teach. Well, the way the sentences is organized in Greek, the emphasis is on making disciples. Is that, is that the most important thing there, out of those four things? How do we do that? So I think too often we think we, <coughs> your first contact shouldn't be to wrap them on the head to try to change their thinking. 
Not long ago, Randy preached a wonderful sermon and just struck me that what we need is opportunities to rub shoulders, spend time, make friends with people that need to hear the gospel but might not hear it if you just tried to start with the opening sentence, do you believe? But spend time with them, make friends. Yeah, That's why I think it's an incredible opportunity to go out and be part of an organization that has all kinds of people. And you're spending time with them for several hours. Sunday morning, the Lopers Running Club. Think of that, 42 years. Yeah. Opportunity to mix 350 people together in small groups yep. and spend time together. Yep. Well, have you ever been in a church where the real emphasis was on spreading the gospel? I belonged to a church once back in Baltimore, Maryland. I was a student at Johns Hopkins University taking my master's in public health. And there was a small church in the northern part of that city that um, the, the pastor and one of the, well, there was a doctor who worked there in that area and he said, I'd like to spend half of my time, I'm willing to cut back half on my, in my practice and spend the other half with this church. And I'd like to work with the pastor and to see what would happen if we, we really did everything we could, put a full-time effort involving church members into spreading the gospel in this area. That little church almost doubled its membership in nine months. Wow. We were doing five-day plans to stop smoking because that was a big thing in those days. We were doing cooking classes. We were doing, and every, even the five-day plans to stop smoking, we would break them up in little groups and they would, maybe three or four smokers would be linked with two church members. Talk about, what, and the church members were involved in every program in what way or other way or another. And guess what happened? We, I, we personally, my wife and I, met a lady her husband, who was a wife of a pastor of another Protestant church. And I don't even know how she found out about us. I don't remember the details. But she says, I'm never going to give up my, my husband's church. I'm, and I belong there. But she says, I want to come to your church because it's so exciting to be there. It's, it, things are happening there. So we would, we would drive by her house, stop and pick up this pastor from another Protestant church and take her to our church every Sabbath morning. Hmm. It was a blessing to be a member of that church. We need to do more of that. Well, do we behave in ways that demonstrate clearly that we know that our primary purpose for being organized as churches is to spread the gospel? Spread the gospel? From Acts of the Apostles, page 29, Christ did not tell his disciples that their work would be easy. He, <laughs> Hardly. Yeah. Okay. He assured them that he would be with them and that if they would go forth in faith, they should move under the shield of omnipotence. He bade them be brave and strong, for one mightier than angels would be in their ranks, the general of the armies of heaven. He made full provision for the prosecution of their work and took upon himself the responsibility of its success. So long as they obeyed his word and worked in connection with him, they could not fail. I want to interrupt for just a second, Gordon. Could we claim, if we decided to, to do something to try to spread the gospel to others, could we claim that we are working hand in hand with Jesus Christ? Isn't that what it says right there? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, how can you lose? Okay. Go to all nations, he bade them. <clears throat> Go to the farthest part of the habita habitable globe and be assured that my presence will be with you even there. Labor in faith and confidence, for the time will never come when I will forsake you. I will be with you always, helping you to perform your duty, guiding, comforting, sanctifying, sustaining you, giving you success in speaking words that shall draw the attention of others to heaven. Acts the Apostles, page 29. Hmm. Man, what a promise. Christ has promised to be with us until the end. Now, sometimes we hear people suggesting that, you know, as we get just right up to the end, that God is going to leave us. No, what does this say? He will be with us to the end. 
Do we behave appropriately in light of that promise? Tim B? Principles of good leadership apply in all forms of a society, including church, or including the church. However, the leader of the church must be more than a leader. He must also be a servant. There is an apparent contradiction between being a leader and being a servant. How can one lead and serve at the same time? Does not the leader occupy a position of honor? Does he not command and expect others to obey him? How then does the excuse me does he occupy the lower position of being a servant of receiving orders and fulfilling them? In order to resolve the paradox, we must also we must look at Jesus. He supremely represented the principle of leadership that serves. His whole life was of service, and at the same time, he was the greatest teacher the world has ever seen. Arthur Keo or G. Arthur Keo Church Today. What do you, what do you, I mean, obviously we think about the washing of the feet and so forth that we've already talked about. What other things pop up in your mind as being examples of the servant, the servanthood or the service of Jesus Christ? Anything come to mind right offhand? His feeding okay. of Thousands. Thousands, yes. Yep. He said, well, I don't want these people to go home hungry. No, said, Feed them. Yeah. Loving concern. Yeah, loving concern for people in the ordinary needs of the days. And, and the children, remember when the yeah. children were there? Yeah. He was concerned even to the least of the people and in even, the crowd. Yeah, and even after he'd gone to heaven, he came back and the disciples had fished all night, seven of them, caught nothing. And what is Jesus doing? He could have been in heaven. He's cooking them breakfast. He's cooking them breakfast. <laughs> I mean, is that service or is that what? Love. It's love, for sure. Can you think of any church leaders that you know of in the 21st century who are truly servant leaders? I'm just asking. It's not something I think about very often. <laughs> should I be looking for church leaders that are servants? Well, shouldn't we? If this is the kind of leadership, if this is Jesus' kind of leadership, shouldn't we be? Shouldn't the church be doing everything possible to develop that kind of leaders? And how do we do that? Well, we've already mentioned church discipline. Do we always follow the golden rule in Matthew 7, 12? And you remember that it says, do not do for others what you want them to do for you. This is the meaning of the law of Moses and of the teachings of the prophets. Now, some people have tried to claim that Jesus got most of his ideas from other people before him. What did the other people before him say? Do you remember in, along this line? The, the code of Hammurabi and so forth. Do no harm. Okay, you know what, when, what almost every, every mother says to her sons? If you don't want someone to do to you, don't do it to them. Okay, is that different than this? This is more proactive, the other way is... Uh, it's very different, ultimately. Yeah. Very different, ultimately. But that, that's the ordinary thing. If you don't want him to hit you, don't hit him. I mean, you know, every mother said that, I'm sure. But Jesus said, do for others what you want them to do for you. This is, pro it's, if you stop and think about it, it's a completely different orientation. So there's no way that this came from somebody like Hammurabi or something like that. And you don't really get that so much out of the Old Testament. That's one of the problems. The Jews don't really have that much to contribute. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, in light of what we've studied in this Bible lesson so far, it seems clear that church leadership is essential. I think we all would agree with that. But to find the right kind of leaders is a real challenge among selfish Laodiceans. Did I call us that? Mm -hmm. Selfish Laodiceans in our day? Well, in church committees and in other church activities, do we always behave in a manner that recognizes that Christ is the head of the church? Mm -hmm. Or do we fight for what we want? 
when we are in church committees. Jesus made it very clear that Christians, well, uh, anyway, Jesus made it very clear that Christian leaders are not supposed to be like leaders of the world. Do we make it easy for our church leaders to be servant leaders? I can tell you about a man that I know personally that when he didn't get his way, he read, wrote a book with he wrote a book with the intention of specifically of, of tearing the Adventist church apart. Are we prepared to assist pastors, our pastors, by using the spiritual gifts that have been given to us? How many of us have spiritual gifts? Well, well, we should know the answer. Many. Everyone has some everyone has at least one gift. At least one. Are we using our spiritual gifts for the upbuilding of the church? Well, is it clear in your church that the way the church itself is organized is resulting in the spread of the gospel? One of the most outstanding servant leaders of modern times was Mahatma Gandhi. I'm sure that uh, you all have either read about or watched movies that document something about his life. Unfortunately, although he was attracted to Christianity because of what he learned about the life of Christ, he told Christians that the reason he did not become a Christian was because there were so few of them who acted like Jesus. Could that be said about your church? So why would a man so in unprepossessing, so simple in his life and so forth, how did he have such so much influence? He wasn't, he wasn't born to some incredible family. His, 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 his descendants were fairly powerful, but before him there wasn't any big thing. He well, spent his early years in South Africa, and then he went back to India. Yes, Martin. I think I think God can use people that are willing to be used. doesn't really matter what religion they are. Yeah. Do you think we'll see um, uh, Mahatma Gandhi in heaven? I think so. Oh. He had great concern for his fellow men. Yep. Well, if, if someone of us followed the Mahatma Gandhi model, would uh, that person make a good church leader? Those aren't supposed to be tough questions. Are we constantly offering prayers to God, asking His guidance so that we may serve and that He may guide us and choosing spiritual leaders for our church organizations? Do we tend to church, choose spirit, church leaders that are people who are our friends or who uh, will support the causes we believe in or do we church, choose church leaders because they're truly spiritual leaders? We all recognize that some kind of church organization is necessary. I don't think any of us would argue that no church organization is not necessary. What will happen when, because of a national Sunday law and an international Sunday law, it becomes impossible to have a Seventh-day Adventist church organization? Just today, I had a telephone call from a friend of mine who lives and works in Cuba. He's Cuban. And in Cuba, the average salary is $30 a month. Oh. One dollar a day? One dollar a day. And recently there was that, you know, back in November of 2017, there was that terrible, not November, it must have been September, something like Hurricane Maria came through there and swiped the northern coast of Korea <laughs> and just wiped out a whole sections of the northern coast, including a number of churches. And it's a challenge because the Adventist church, and I guess the Catholic church being there for so long probably gets away with this, but the Adventist church is not allowed to own any property. The, most of the property the church did own was taken away by the, by the communist government when they came in. But, so the Adventist church is not allowed to own any property. So in order to hold a, hold a church, to have a, a place where people can meet, 
you have to have a house for the pastor and you have to have a living room or some build room in the building is big enough to hold a, a house church. So these churches that were destroyed were pastor's homes. Now that's a challenge when they're destroyed by a hurricane because the church wants to come in and Gordon remembers this, we and, and Carrie remembers this, we raised a significant amount of money and managed to figure out how to get it to them in Cuba, which is a challenge in itself, uh, got the money to them to try to rebuild five churches. And it's almost, the job's almost finished now. But, you know, you're a pastor living in a, church, in a house, and how did you get all that money to build that brand new house? Mm. Questions. <laughs> and the government is not hesitant to ask lots of questions. So you have to be very subtle, very careful in the way you do things. Yeah. And that's 90 miles off our coast. That's not on the other side of the world. And that's not a place to be open and uh, spill the beans. No. Isn't it better now? Well, maybe so, but how bad was it Some way. before? Well, it's pretty bad. It's still pretty bad if there's yeah. only an income for the average person of a buck a day. Yep. I don't know what that buys in Cuba, having never been Not there. much. Not much. A taxi ride, well, of course it depends. On, the taxi ride is around town is a dollar. So obviously the people who have taxi, and most of the taxis are, are pedal, bicycle pedal powered, or in some cases motorcycle powered things with, that'll carry six or eight people in the back. So if, if you're rich enough to own one of those, you can do a lot better than the average. Most people can't afford to ride in those kind of vehicles. They ride in horse-drawn carriages. Yeah. And those, so, those are a few, yeah. Pictures you see of travel show an awful lot of well-maintained old yeah. 50s cars oh, for yeah. the cars that are yeah. there. And they, those are not for Cubans to ride in. The people who own those cars are the wealthy because they, are, they charge high prices and they're intentionally for... Those cars are in places where the tourists come. And not, not in the rural areas. We traveled around Cuba a little bit. You get a little ways away from the centers of tourists. Not those kind of cars. Well, the question is now, what will happen if, the, when the, if and when the church organization ceases to exist? <clears throat> is it obvious to outside observers that Christ is the head of your church? In his book, Church Discipline, How the Church Protects the Name of Jesus, Jonathan Lehman identifies four ways in which church discipline is a loving response to that protects the unity of the church while advancing its mission. First, church discipline shows love for the individual by helping him or her recognize wrongdoing and with it the need for repentance. Church discipline is redemptive in nature and not simply punitive. So as Gordon was trying to point out, and Matthew 7, 12 points out, if this discipline is necessary, you do it in a loving way, which hopefully will convince that person that they need to change their ways and they want to be a part of the church. Love them back again, right? Second, church discipline shows a love for the church because it aims to um, protect from harm and temptation those who might be new and weak in the faith. Paul talks about that in Romans 14. Don't argue with people because of their personal opinions. Third, church discipline shows love for the world beyond the church walls by allowing the church to project a witness that more accurately displays the transforming power of the gospel. If someone is disciplined, if someone is, needs to be disciplined, and maybe temporarily they're out of the church, what are they going to say about the church that disciplined them out there? Are they going to say, those people were really nice, I'm, I want to go back? Are they going to say, I don't want to have anything to do with those people ever again? Finally, church discipline shows love for Christ through both obedience and the safeguarding of his reputation. That's from our Adult Teacher Sabbath School Bible Study Guide, um, page 161. Of course, that's in the teacher section. Well, how successful have we been as a church in promoting the development of servant leaders? J. 
Jim, you said that um, you hadn't even thought of that. Could we develop a system for encouraging that kind of leadership? What would it take? Seems like it's easier to do that kind of interaction yourself than to get somebody else to do it. But we need to train church leaders. Is that our job? Well, I mean, we have to choose them at some point in time, and you hope they're, they've developed that skill before you choose them, right? It's a little hard to choose them and then or see if they you... would be chosen because they had that skill. And how many people do you see standing around who have those skills? Looking for an opportunity to serve. Well, I would say the best possible way to do that is to say, what would Jesus do? How many of our, you know, Ellen White said, I think it's page 81, somewhere there, in Desire of Ages, it would be well for us to spend a thoughtful hour each day considering the life of Christ, especially the closing scenes. Mm -hmm. If we could convince a group of people in the church of Sabbath school class, for example, everybody in the Sabbath school class convinced them to do that, would it make a difference? Oh, yeah. Would that be a possible way to develop real servant leaders? Well, the challenge is thrown to you out there. We've asked some pretty penetrating questions here today, and we got some of them from our Bible study guide, and we added some ourselves. But your church is what you live with. It's not our church, it's your church. So what could you do in your setting to develop true servant leaders? That's, that, that's what we need to do. The, the Christ-like leaders is what our church needs in order to finish the gospel. Jesus is there waiting. The Holy Spirit is there waiting to join us in accomplishing that task. He's not, he, he, he's not rushing ahead of us. He's, he's given us that responsibility, and he recognizes it's for our good to do that, to work with him in the finishing of the gospel. And you and I have been challenged to do that job. Are you ready? Our kind and loving Father, it's a great privilege to think of you and talk about you and, and share the truth about you as we understand it from the scriptures. We thank you for these lessons which have been prepared for us at great effort and great cost. May they lead us to understand more clearly what true servant leadership is all about and how we can be a part of that ourselves and inspire others around us to be a part of that as well as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.